Today we'll take over 140,000 data points of people being killed or injured by guns and visualize them with DeckGL and Google Maps. We can go from a heat map of the entire country down to the actual street view of a neighborhood where the shit went down. We'll start by adding a scatterplot layer for every single point in the dataset. Then we'll add a tooltip to see how many people were injured or killed at a given incident. Then we'll cluster points together into a heat map based on the map's zoom level. Lastly, we'll cluster points into a hexagon with a one mile radius and extrude them into a 3D shape where the elevation represents the amount of violence in that space. We can do all of this data visualization efficiently thanks to a library called DeckGL. It was created by Uber to visualize their own data and is able to run computations efficiently by offloading them to the GPU with WebGL. Say hello to my little friend! Take a look at their showcase for some awesome examples of companies using this technology in production. I think my favorite is Escape. It uses the DeckGL arc layer to visualize the cheapest flights based on your location around the world. Now I realize that guns are a hot political issue in the United States, so I've tried to make this visual as neutral as possible. The data comes from the Gun Violence Archive from the years 2013 to 2018. On the live demo, you can filter by defensive use, suicide, and so on to get a better picture of how the data is distributed. Before we get started, let's talk a little bit more about how DeckGL works. You can think of it as a layer or multiple layers that sit on top of your Google map. When the user pans around or zooms in and out, the overlay will stick to the map. And an awesome thing about this is that the layers can be composited. In other words, you can set layers on top of each other, add some transparency, and DeckGL will calculate the composite colors that are actually rendered in the screen. And that can give you some amazing 3D visuals on top of a two-dimensional map. The actual JavaScript library itself follows the reactive programming paradigm. So it's very simple and familiar to most front-end developers. All you really need is a good dataset, a Google Maps API key, a few lines of JavaScript, and you'll be up and running with interactive 3D visuals on top of your map. The first thing you'll need to get started is a Google Maps API key. Create a new project or use an existing project on the Google Cloud Platform console. From there, go to the API screen. You'll find the Google Maps JavaScript API, enable it, and then go to the Credentials tab and grab your browser API key. Just make a note of the API key for now. We'll need it in a minute or so when we get into the code. You can use DeckGL in any framework, but it provides additional support for React. In this video, I'm going to use vanilla JavaScript with Webpack, and we'll set it up with hot module replacement for a nice developer experience. Go ahead and open up VS Code, and keep in mind you can find all of these steps in this lesson on Fireship.io. First, we'll run npm init with the Y flag to set up a new npm project. Then we'll install Webpack and Webpack dev server into the development environment. From there, I'll open up the package JSON, and I'm going to add a couple of scripts that we can use to build and serve the app. The build command runs webpack and outputs everything into the public folder, which is where we'll actually put our production code. Then the start command will use webpack dev server to serve that code locally on localhost 8080, and it will also perform hot module replacement whenever our source code changes. The next thing we'll do is install DeckGL. It's organized in a mono repo, so there's different packages that you may or may not need. We're going to need the Google Maps package, layers, and aggregation layers. The next thing we'll do is create a file for our JavaScript source code in the source directory. And a little VS Code pro tip here is to create that file with a slash and it will automatically create the directory structure for you. Then we'll do the same thing for the public HTML file. Then inside this HTML, we'll just start with a plain HTML document and we'll make a reference to the main JS file, which is where Webpack will build our source code. After that, we'll add a deferred script tag for the Google Maps JavaScript API. This script has two required parameters. The first one is the API key, which is the browser API key that you got from the Google Cloud Platform console. Then the callback is the name of a function defined on the window that initializes the map with whatever options you want to pass to it. We'll define that one in just a minute in our JavaScript code. Then the last thing we'll want to do is go into the body of the HTML and add a div with an ID of map. This div will be replaced by the actual Google map, and in our case, we want to display a full screen map, so we'll use some CSS to set the width and height to 100% of the viewport. Now we'll go ahead and open up our JavaScript file, and we'll want to define a function on the window object. This is the callback that we set on the Google Maps script tag. The first argument is the actual div that will be replaced by the map, so we'll go ahead and get that by its ID. And then you can add a bunch of additional options here depending on how you want to customize your app. In fact, Google provides a wizard that helps you quickly customize the appearance of your map. That's how I created the dark map that you see in the demo. So now that we have this init map function on the window, we can run npm start to tell Webpack to build our code. 
that will also spin up a server on localhost 8080. So if you navigate there, you should see the default map at this point. And your code should rebuild anytime you update and save the index.js file. Now that we have this initial setup out of the way, we need to get some actual data to display on the map. Now this can be very easy or very difficult depending on the data you're working with. If you want to go the easy route, you can simply grab the JSON data that lives on my web server. But since you're a developer, I'm assuming you want to use your own custom data. A great place to find free data that's already well formatted is from Kaggle datasets. But in most cases, this data is going to be in CSV format. An easy way to convert this data to the proper format is to use the node package convert CSV to JSON. From there, create a file called convert.js in the root of your project. Then inside the script, we can create a very simple node script that has an input in CSV format and then an output in JSON. Now we can just run that script from the command line and we've magically converted our custom data set into JSON format that we can use with DECGL. Your data should be an array of JSON objects. So in our case, it looks like this. The property names on this object can be anything you want. So you don't really need to format your data in any special way. Because as you'll see in the code, we tell DECGL exactly how to access this data. Let's move into our index.js file, and we'll import Google Maps overlay, as well as the layers that we want to display from DECGL. Now, like I said earlier, DECGL uses a reactive programming paradigm, so I like to create my layers inside of a function. Anytime your map or data changes, you tell DECGL to rebuild the entire map. Under the hood, it's looking at the diff to update things efficiently, very similar to React.js. It can do that because every layer is required to have a unique ID, and DECGL uses that to track the changes for that specific layer. The next option that you'll need to pass is the data. So in our case, this will just be the path to the local JSON file, but this could also be a remote URL or a promise that resolves to the JSON object. Now, every layer has a variety of optional parameters that you can pass to customize the way the points are displayed. Things like opacity and pixel radius are pretty self-explanatory. Now, for every point in the dataset, DECGL is going to call the function that you pass to get position. So get position is very similar to a for each loop, where D represents an individual object in the dataset. The function needs to return an array of the longitude point and the latitude point in that order. It's not latitude longitude like you might see in other map programs, it's the more mathematically correct format of XY. You can also use functions to compute other properties like the actual fill color on the scatter plot. In this case, I'm looking at if the number of people killed in this incident is greater than zero, in which case I'll make the dot red, otherwise I'll make it orange, which means that there are only injuries. And that's all it takes to define a scatterplot layer. From there, I'm going to jump down into the init map function that we wrote earlier. We'll define a variable called overlay that's equal to a Google Maps overlay instance. Then it takes an array of layers that will be stacked on top of each other. So we'll go ahead and add our scatterplot function there. Then the final step is to add overlay set map with the actual Google Maps instance. So that's how we initialize a map for the first time. If you're running updates on a map, you would call set props with any subsequent updates to the same map. I just wanted to point that out, but we're actually not going to use it in this simplified demo. From here, if you open the browser, you should see all the points plotted on the map. But I'd like to make these a little more interactive by adding a tooltip when the user hovers over an individual point. We can do that by setting the pickable option to true on the scatterplot layer. And then from there, we'll define a function that runs on the on hover event. This will give us access to the actual data object that represents that point, and then also its xy coordinates. We'll grab an element from the DOM called tooltip, and then if an object exists, we'll go ahead and insert some HTML into that tooltip based on the actual data object. And if an object does not exist, we'll simply hide the tooltip by setting its opacity to zero. And you can also handle click events, so if the user clicks on a given point, we can take them to the actual instant report on Gun Violence Archive. Now a problem with the map currently is that it's kind of hard to visualize 140,000 points all at once. Fortunately, DECGL has aggregation layers that will cluster the points into meaningful shapes. This time, let's go ahead and create a function that returns a heat map layer. This function uses the same getter for position, and we also have the option to calculate the weight for each point. By default, every data point has a weight of one, but we want to weight the data points based on how violent the incident was. So we'll go ahead and take the number of people killed in that incident and then add it to the number of people injured times 0.5. So you get the most points for killing people, but you also get bonus points for injuring people as well. We'll go ahead and set the pixel radius to 60, and then we could also customize colors here as well, but we'll just go ahead and skip that for now. And lastly, we'll come down here and add the heat map to our layers. You can see I've switched the map to dark mode to see things a little bit better. And you'll notice we get different clustering patterns based on the zoom level of the map. 
If we zoom in all the way, we'll start to see the individual instants that make up the larger clusters. The heat map is useful, but we may want to cluster our points based on a specific boundary. And a great way to do that is with the hexagon layer. This allows us to cluster points into a specific radius and then increase its elevation in the third dimension based on how violent that area is. We can do that by defining a getter for the elevation weight using the same logic that we used in the previous example. We can customize the appearance with a variety of different parameters, and you can even use your own algorithm to control how the points are clustered into the hexagon. Go ahead and add hexagon to the layers, and you'll now see that we get these extruded shapes on the map. We can look at the elevation of the hexagon to determine how violent that neighborhood is. And the color of the hexagon becomes more red as the violence increases. Now we've barely only scratched the surface on what's possible with DeckGL. If you need high performance data visualization on a large data set, it's definitely worth checking out. I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up there. If this video helped you, please like and subscribe and consider becoming a pro member at Fireship.io for access to even more content. Thanks for watching and I will talk to you soon. Oh!